Well, we come today to one of the great chapters of the Old Testament, maybe one of the really high points of the Old Testament is Deuteronomy chapter 30. If you were traveling through the Old Testament and you wanted to hit the high points, this would be one of them that you wouldn't want to miss. It's a chapter that highlights the spectacular grace of God. Sometimes we talk about amazing grace, and I'm sure it is, but um, it's even more than amazing. It's spectacular, and you get that when you read Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy 29 and 30 are a unit. They belong together. It's the beginning of the end of the book of Deuteronomy, and the writer has um, rehearsed their history with this new generation that's on the border. Their parents and grandparents have wandered through the wilderness for 40 years. And now a new generation is on the border, and they're about to cross over and become materialists, become inheritors of the promise that God had made to them many, many years, generations before. And so Deuteronomy 29 works this way. It's what you would call a covenant renewal document. It's a, they're, they're, they're renewing their covenant with God. The previous generation God had made a covenant with, but they had become unbelieving and turned away. And so you have this new generation, and God is calling them to renew that covenant before they go into the promised land. It's somewhat like you and I, if you're married, where there are times in a marriage where it's appropriate to renew the covenant, renew the vow. Maybe it's gone sideways or it hasn't gone well and you're trying to put it back together. It's actually a good thing to renew a covenant, a vow. It actually strengthens the marriage and says, I'm still in. In effect, what God wants to know on the border is, are these people still in? Are they willing to go forward with them? Will they renew their covenant? That's chapter 29. And then you come to chapter 30, and the choice is laid before them, and the question, what will they do? Chapter 30, I would like to read to you. I want to read you the whole thing. I, I, I know that, um, you know, I listen to a lot of preachers on YouTube and the radio, and everywhere I can get them, because I've got to figure out how to do this before I'm dead. And... Um, but what I find is, where I'm disappointed, is they don't actually read Scripture, most of them. Or they give you a verse or two. But I, my job description, as I understood it from the book of Timothy, was actually to pay attention to the public reading of Scripture and then to preach. So I, I never apologize for this, but I, I do want to explain to you why I, I like reading fairly large chunks, because th it's the Scripture God promised to bless. And so if I miss, which quite often I do, God won't with his word. So let me read you Deuteronomy 30. And why don't you just silently pray, Lord, would you, would you plant these words in my mind so I understand them, and would you move my heart so I act upon these words? This is how it goes. When all these blessings and curses I've set before you come on you, and you take them to heart, wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations, and when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him, with all your heart and with all your soul, according to everything I command you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. Even if you've been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. He will bring you to the land that belonged to your ancestors and you'll take possession of it. He'll make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors. The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. The Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies who hate and persecute you. You will again obey the Lord and follow all his commands I'm giving you today. Then the Lord your God will make you most prosperous in all the work of your hands and in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock, and the crops of your land. The Lord will again delight in you and make you prosperous just as he delighted in your ancestors if you obey the Lord your God and keep his commands and decrees that are written in this book of the law and turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Now what I'm commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It's not up in heaven so that you have to ask who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it. Nor is it beyond the sea, so that you have to ask, Who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us, so we may obey it? 
No, the word is very near you. It's in your mouth, and it's in your heart, so you may obey it. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you'll live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you're entering to possess. But if your hearts turn away and you're not obedient, and if you're drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you'll certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you're crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him, for the Lord is your life, and he'll give you many years in the land he swore to give your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is one of the very important chapters, as I said, in the Old Testament. So important that Paul takes it up and uses it in Romans 10 to unpackage and explain salvation. So it's a chapter that's not easily discarded or put aside. The key word or words in Deuteronomy 30 is the word return or turn. You see it in verse 2 where he calls them to return to God. And then in verse 10 he talks about turning to the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. But also here in verses 4 and 5 is the idea that God will turn, that God will return. It's the old word, that the one word that would capture it would be the old word repent. Um, so it's this idea that they need to turn, return, and if they do, God will do exactly the same thing. It's a chapter that talks about the spectacular grace of God because verse 5 or verse 4 says, even if you've been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. If you've got as far away from God as you can get, that's the thought, then even from there, you can turn and God will take you back. If you return to him, he'll return to you. So the, the timeless, if I could put it that way, truth in Deuteronomy 30 would just be this. No matter how far from God you have got, you are welcome to come back. No, no matter how far away you find yourself, you are welcome today to come back. I don't want to mess around. I don't want to have a hidden agenda. So I'll just tell you what I want to do. I want to go through this chapter and try and explain God's heart to you. And then on his behalf, I would like to invite you to return, to respond to him. And I'll invite you up when we worship and we can respond to God and give him back our whole heart. Billy Graham and his wife Ruth have five children two boys, three daughters, the boys being Franklin and Ned. Ned you don't hear much about. The three daughters are Anne, Gigi, who have both um, spoken and written a lot of material, and then a daughter named after their mom, Ruth. So Anne, Gigi, Ruth. Ruth, to my knowledge, has only written one book. It's a good book for a pastor to read. It's called, In Every Pew There Sits a Broken Heart. That's true. And it's a good book for pastors to get a hold of when they're talking to people. She tells her story in there, and it's a tragic story of how life unraveled for her. She had been through at least two marriages, maybe three, I'm not sure, but I think two, a result of poor choices on her part and certainly on the parts of her husband. Um, it, just, it just blew apart, and the impact cascaded down on the children. It's a tragic story, really. She spent a lot of years feeling the shame and the guilt of the way her life had gone and afraid to really go back and re-engage with her mom and dad. And she had not re-engaged with Billy and Ruth for some time. One day she, start, she felt homesick, as it were. Her second marriage had blown apart, and she decided to drive back to Montreat and see her parents. It was difficult because she didn't quite know, A, how she would be received with all of her stuff, and B, what she would say. She talks about the drive up that long, winding driveway to their home, and, and she froze at the top, and she was afraid to go through the front door. And 
She just, she felt the weight of her stuff, and before she knew it, her car door opened, and she looked, and there was her dad standing there, and he just said, Anne, welcome home, welcome home. That's, that's Deuteronomy 30, and that's God. You may feel the weight of your stuff. You may wonder, if you actually came to him, what he would say. You know what he would say? He'd call you by name, and he'd say, welcome home. That's what he would say. That's what I get out of this chapter, and I want to want to show it to you here. I think the chapter just rolls out like this. It, um, if you read it through, the, the three questions that are just under the surface would be this. What does it mean to return to God? What does it mean to come back to God? The second question that is addressed here is, and if I do, how will I be treated by God? If I do, what will he do with me? And the third question in the light of that is, so what choice are you going to make about you and God? That's the way the chapter spills out. So let's just, let's just think for a minute of that first question. What does it mean to return to God? Um, it, there's a question in the text. It's, it's difficult when you read it to know whether... I make the first move or he does because it just here it's so, it's so fluid that I return, he returns, or he returns, I return. And who makes the first move? I'm not sure. But what is clear is this, that a return to God starts when you know that you're not where you should be and you remember his word. You remember his word. The, the first verse implies that when it says, when all these blessings and curses I've set before you, come on you, and you take them to heart. What blessings and curses? Well, the things that Moses has written about way back, and I think it's about chapter 28. It, it is chapter 28. And that's where, where God has given his word to Moses to give to the people. And so when he says, when these blessings and curses come, he is saying to them, when you remember the word of God, that's, that's where this movement starts. When you, wherever you are, at some point in your life, remember something God said. You might be in a far country, as it were, but you remember something God said. Or it comes through a sermon, or it comes some other way, but it just, it just like comes out of nowhere, and you remember something of God. That's God trying to get your attention. That's the Holy Spirit. It might be a conviction he puts in your heart. It might be a nudge, a prompting, whatever word you give it. But don't ignore it. That's God. How, how, how do I know that? Well, it says in um, Romans 3, and it takes it from one of the Psalms, that nobody seeks God. What that means is if the Holy Spirit were to withdraw from your life or my life, you would not have another thought of God again. The very thought that I should pray, I should get my act together, I'd like to worship, I'd like to be forgiven, the very thought that I, I want to love God and tell Him, the, the very idea of a word of God coming to your heart is God talking to you, making a move to wake you up, to have you recall something maybe that you've forgotten. Now, the second thing is that you actually return. It says in the text that I read to you, that when you and your children return to the Lord your God. So you, you return. What does that mean? Well, it's, it's a word that means repent. It means you were going away from God. Now you have decided to go back to God. So it, it implies a change of direction, obviously, because I was going away from God. Now I'm going to go back towards God. And along with that is the putting away of what displeases God in my life. There's some things that I've been involved in that displease God. I put those away. Be why? Because I'm going back to God and going back to him. That stuff has to be put out of his sight, put away. Without a willingness, if I could put it this way, to give up sin totally, there's little hope of a genuine return to God. Uh, I could illustrate it this way. Um, the lovely thing about Crossroads Church is when you've been here as long as I have, the church has changed. And you're not the people that I spoke to 18 years ago. Most of you have come rather lately. So what I, my job is really easy as, a, as I go on because I, just, I pull back old illustrations and sermons that most of you have never heard. And you think, what? That's new. Where did you get that? Well, I got it from something I said a while ago. But you, you weren't here, so I'm going to do that. And um, I'll tell you what, repentance 
looks like. I was, I was parked on a curb at the end of a dr long driveway that went down to a garage, waiting for someone to come out of the house. Little boy and girl were playing up near the garage. She on a bike, he standing there. When before my eyes, he went up to her and he pushed her off the bike and she skinned her knees on the ground and was right ticked off, which is the Christian way of putting it. And so she, um, she stomped down to the end of the driveway and she yelled at him, I'm going home. And he looked back from the other end and said, well, if you go home, I won't have anybody to play with. And then she came out with a great line, I don't care. <laughs> and um, then there was just, there was silence. Then he, he said those words, looking down at her, he said, well, I'm sorry. And she had another great line, sorry isn't good enough for me, she said. And I thought, whoa, how's this going to play out? But nobody, they just, they were looking at each other. And then, then he said these words, he said, okay, I won't do it again. And when he said those words, she walked back down to where he was, and they took up where they left off as though nothing had happened. And I thought, I just witnessed repentance. It's more than saying, I'm sorry. It's the decision to stop doing what's broken the relationship. That's what repentance is. It's a turnaround for sure, but it's this decision that says whatever broke the relationship, I will stop doing so the relationship can be restored, so the relationship can be repaired. And then you begin to obey God. That's part of returning. Um, again, it just says here, when you return to the Lord your God, then obey him with all your heart and with all your soul. It's not only turning around and putting away, it's beginning to do what God has asked you to do. Now, this is where we get into trouble. We say, well, that's way too difficult. That's too hard. I mean, seriously, this book was written like how many thousands of years ago? And like the world we live in, we have stupid smartphones, I mean, and we have, um, we have all this stuff, and now we're told we can do this or that. Like, th th that just doesn't relate to the real. It's just, it's too hard. I mean, what about the area of sex? I mean, really, is God, is God serious that that's only for two heterosexuals in covenant relationship? Like, really? That's, how, how do you do that? Well, this, this says, did you hear when I read it? It was interesting. It said, it was down about verse 11. It said, now what I'm commanding today is not too difficult for you beyond your reach. Here's the, here's the thing about God that's just so unusual. For whatever reason, he thinks that what he wrote is not that hard to do. That's what he thinks. He thinks that it's not idealistic, it's not unachievable, it's not way over our heads. For whatever reason, God thinks that what he wrote, people can actually do. Well, I, I don't even know what he wants me to do. Well, it, it says there, it says, well, it's not hard to find out. It's not up in heaven. You don't have to go up there and get it. You don't have to go across the ocean to discover it. It's near you. It's near you, it's in your mouth, and it's in your heart, so that you can obey him, it says here. What does that mean? Well, they, they didn't have Bibles, and they didn't have Bibles on phones, and um, they, they heard the Bible read. They heard the Word of God read. So they heard it from the mouth, and then they would, they would try as best they could to retain it by memorizing it. So it's a way of saying, you hear this all the time. What are you hearing from God? That's the stuff you're to obey. What are the things that he's putting in your heart and convicting you about? That's the stuff you're to obey. The answer is not that I can't or it's too difficult. The issue is I won't. And until we deal with the I won't and change to I will, there's nothing God can do to help us. A, a humble, contrite heart that God looks for is one that just comes under the word of God, not sits in judgment on it, and says, I will obey you. And it's not too difficult. In fact, he even gives you his spirit to, to give you the power to do it. Like, that's, that's amazing to me that he would even do that. So, anyways, to return to God is to um, 
listen again to his word that he puts in your mind and your heart. It's to have a turnaround. It's to begin to obey him. It's, um, it's to put away those things that displease him. So what does God do when I do that? What does God do if I turn around and begin walking towards him? What it, it says a couple of really interesting things here. Verse 3 says, he'll restore me. What does restore mean? Well, I, negatively, it means you won't be on probation. You won't be on probation. You ever, you ever been in this place where you get that he forgives you, but your heart sinks because you have such a track record of sin, and you're so discouraged because you're coming back again with the same stuff? Is it just me that gets there? I guess so. Well, let me tell you how I deal with it. I remember the posture of God when people turn around. It's, it's in Luke 15. It's not, you don't stand there like this and say, well, what did you do this time? That's how we treat people. What did you do this time? And it's not, it's not like this, like, okay, well, we'll, just, we'll, we'll see how long this lasts. No, no, the posture of God is welcome home, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. You're restored. You're not on probation. Churches, Christians, put people on probation. God doesn't. God says, welcome home. The word restore means put in your rightful place where you should be, where you should have been, where I always want you to be. That's the word restore. Now, the other thing it says is that he will bring you back. It's another thing God does. Verse 5, he will bring you back to the land. Here is a key when it comes to repentance. A lot of times people push back from repentance because it's like, this is, this is hard work turning around and kind of going against the stream again, and there's a lot of stuff to I don't even know if I can do that for very long. But you, you see, we, we often skip over the verse that says, he'll bring you back. I think when Jesus was trying to illustrate repentance in Luke 15, he drew on Deuteronomy 30. Do you remember the parable in Luke 15? It's one parable in three parts. There's a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost boy. To be lost means you're not in the right place. The sheep should have been with the rest of the sheep in the fold. That coin should have been in the purse. The boy should have been in his father's home. Lost means you're in the wrong place. If you're not in a relationship with Jesus Christ, where he knows you and you know him and you hear him and he hears you, you're lost in the wrong place. So he, he tells that story of the lost sheep, lost coin, lost boy. But he, he has a line that summarizes each bit, and he basically says, I'm illustrating for you repentance. There's joy in the presence of God over one sinner who repents. So what is repentance? How, how does a sheep repent? Better yet, how does a coin repent? How can that illustrate repentance? The lost boy, maybe. It's interesting because I pondered that for a long time. That sheep that was lost, all it could do was acknowledge its lostness. And I'm told by smarter people that know more about sheep than me that when a sheep's lost and it realizes it, it just starts making noise and waits. It's lost. The shepherd who's looking for the sheep hears that and begins speaking to the sheep. And the sheep responds. Repentance at its core is the acceptance of being found. That sheep did not fight the shepherd. He heard the shepherd's voice. He submitted to the shepherd. The sheep was thrown around the shepherd's shoulders and at great cost to the shepherd, he has to take that sheep back over the valleys and the hills through night, through day, to the fold. That's repentance, not fighting God, accepting that I'm found. What about the turnaround bit? That comes out in the parable of the lost son. The boy turned around. But did you ever see in there that he, it was God that turned around? with the boy. They turned around together. 
The boy didn't do it alone. In a Middle Eastern village, the, the, um, the, the residences, the shots were so close as to almost overlook the street. So a boy that put shame on his father and on the village, if he was coming back, would run a gauntlet before he got back to his, fa his father's house. When the father runs to the boy and receives the boy, he's running the gauntlet for and with the boy. That boy never repents on his own. He repents with the father. The father turns around with him and walks back with him. Deuteronomy 30, he will bring you back. When you hear him say, come back, and you say yes, he goes to you, and the two of you turn around together and together walk back to God. This is not something you do on your own. Most of the time, we've, we've strayed away from it or pushed back from it because I, I can't do this. He said, well, you can because I'm actually going to do this with you. And they go back together. So that's another thing the father does. And then he says, I'll circumcise your heart. And you say, what? That, that was an outer symbol of being part of the Jewish nation. God says, but it needs, something needs to happen on the inside for you to really be mine. It, it better for our understanding would be what it says in Hosea where Hosea says, if you return to him, God says, I will, I will heal your waywardness and love you freely. Don't, you need that. I need that. We need to be healed. Jeremiah, God says, I will heal your backsliding if you return to me. That's that word. That, that's what it's getting at when it says, I'll, I'll do something on your heart. I'll heal your heart. So you want to stay home and don't want to wander. And then he says, I'll bless you. This is the most incredible part. This is the spectacular part about God's grace. I will bless you more than you were blessed before. Um, I love that. I'll make you more prosperous, verse 5 says, and numerous than your ancestors. And, and I, I have, all of us actually, if we have an NIV Bible, probably have the newer NIV, which I don't like, but it's really hard to get... Um, uh, back to the 1980s translation of the NIV. And this one, in my opinion, messes it up in verse 9. It says, The Lord your God will make you most prosperous in all the work of your hands. It should be, The Lord your God will make you more prosperous. The idea is when you return to God, He's unlike anybody you've ever broken relationship with before. He won't just say, We'll get along. He won't just bless you. He will bless you over the top. You'll be more blessed than if you went away. Now, that doesn't mean go away so you can get more blessed, but it, it, it just, it's his character to do that. He's an over-the-top kind of God. Now, I, I put this out for your consideration. You consider it after checking out God's heart. I think God is more excited and delighted and overjoyed when you return than he is heartbroken when you leave. That seems to be the way this scripture and Luke 15 go. And then he'll throw a party. If I add Luke 15 to this, he throws a party. There's joy in the presence of God in heaven over one sinner that repents. There's joy, a party in heaven. Now, interestingly, the religious types that Jesus was talking to, they wouldn't say the word God because that was holy. They would say heaven. So Jesus um, uses their language. He says there's more joy in heaven over one sinner. It really means there's joy in the heart of God. That's what it means. The joy is in God's heart when you turn around. Uh, that's amazing. Zephaniah says he will rejoice over you with singing. Uh, it's even stronger in the, in, in the New American Standard Bible. It says he will, he will release shouts of joy over you. Imagine that. He takes delight in you. Shouts of joy. The biggest challenge that I think we have as Christians is to get our headspace into God's headspace and start thinking like he does. Because we don't want to believe that's true about us. But he says it's true. I will take great delight in you. There is huge joy in the heart of God that spills over to everybody around him when you decide you're coming back. So the last question that is under the text is what will our choice be? That's verse 15. It's where the whole book reaches its climax. Everything from here on is just down to uh, chapter 34 where you touch down on the runway. This is the high point and the rest is uh, addendums or appendix. Um, verse 15. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. 
Verse 19, I call heavens, the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life. Why would he have to tell us that? Because we're so screwed up that we think death is life. And we don't know that he's life. Choose life, he says. What? If you had a choice before you of life or death, would you need someone to say, oh, you should choose life? But apparently we do. See, we're, the bad choices that we make, they inevitably lead to death. You know it. Something dies inside, and things begin to die, relationships, all sorts of things. And it goes from bad to worse to worse. And if that isn't stopped, you'll end up in hell, eternal death, forever and ever and ever. Choose life. Not, what does that mean, choose life? Do you, do you not hear echoes of Jesus? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Choose me, Jesus says, and you'll live. There is not a more important choice that anybody makes in life than the choice that they're confronted with when Jesus says, choose me, or when God says, you can come back. What are you going to do with that choice? That will, our choices have eternal consequences. That's the dignity that God has placed in people that he's let us make choices that actually have eternal consequences. It's, um, it's a choice that matters more than any other choice you'll make in life. So that's Deuteronomy 30. The question is, what will we do? No, let me say it again. The, the big point, the big picture is, no matter how far you've gone away, you are welcome to come back. And I've asked the Lord about this personally. And I feel I got the green light from him to say to you today, on his behalf, you are welcome to come back today. You're welcome to come back. All I can do on his behalf is say you're welcome. Some people have gone so far away that we look at their life and we say, that's incredible. Is that even recoverable? Other people look so well put together and we sit with each other and we look so Christian but in our hearts, something's died. And we've gone a long way away. And nobody knows it but you and God. You too are welcome to come back. And the change would be dramatic. Restored. I worked with a guy for a few years when I sold real estate. Um, I didn't set out to be a pastor. I mean, who would want to be a pastor? Seriously. I mean, <laughs> who would want to get up here and have to speak every Sunday? And, and um, you know, it just... It just um, Every pastor I knew just didn't connect with, with life and real people. And I thought, that, that if there's one thing, that's the one thing I wouldn't do. Um, but apparently it was, and I did. But I sold real estate in Regina for a while, and I worked with a guy that was the vilest, crudest, out there person. He was an old guy, about 50, and um, he... <laughs> What's so funny about that? He was, and I was about 26 at the time, and his name was Gwyn, but I liked him. He was real. Just said what came to his mind, and it usually wasn't good. And he was Welsh. Welsh people, for the most part, have beautiful voices. He had a beautiful voice, Gwyn. So we used to have our sales meeting every morning on Broad Street in Regina, and then we would, a bunch of us, whoever was there, we'd get up and we'd walk the block and a half to the Sheraton Hotel and we'd have toast and coffee and like realtors do, you try and put in an hour sometime during the day. To, no, it's not true. Um, but, but we had a good time. It was a good life. Um, and we're, just Gwyn and I were on the way down Broad Street to the Sheraton Hotel. He, <laughs> he stops and he turns to me and said, I used to be like you. I thought, oh yeah, young. And he, he said, no, 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 no. I used to be a Christian, and I, I was so dumbfounded, I had, I had no words. Not Gwen, not a Christian. Not, he, he was like the most unchristian person in Regina, and then the most unlikely candidate to be a Christian. He said, I used to be a Christian. I said, Gwen, 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 talk to me about it. We stood on the sidewalk in the middle of Regina, 900 below zero, and he told me, they don't get Chinooks there, folks. I've done my time. He, he told me 
that when he was young, he was married to a nice woman. And they attended a church in Winnipeg, and he loved the Lord with all of his heart. Something happened. I don't remember. It all unraveled and fell apart, including his marriage. And he went as far away from God as you could go. He was unrecognizable as a Christian. And on the sidewalk, he said, I used to be you. Then he wanted to know, could I come back? In my heart, I said, well, I'd have to be a big God. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I hadn't read Deuteronomy 30. Thankfully, I knew enough of God's heart and his power to say, yes, you can. We went to the Sheraton. We had toast and coffee. And he gave his life, his heart, back to Jesus Christ. And he changed. And he started coming with us to Hillsdale Baptist Church. I'll never forget sitting beside him during worship. The voice this man had, the worship that he gave God, he was 100% changed. We got moved to Vancouver and we lost track of each other but the last I saw Gwyn, he went on his way rejoicing. God is not partial. There might be a lot of Gwyns here. You are welcome to come back. And I'm going to give you the opportunity. Now we're going to worship. Um, I'm going to pray then we'll worship. And while we're worshiping, the front's open. You're welcome to come up. You're welcome to kneel. You're welcome to lie. Whatever is right for you. In any way you can, make a move that says, God, it's me. I've heard, and I'm coming back. And you let him run to meet you. Um, if you come, then, then after we worship, I'll come back up, and I'll just pray for you. And, and then we'll go on our way. It's not a small thing to make a move to God. He will run to you you make one step toward him. If you feel it's necessary to talk to someone or you'd like some help, there will be people up here with lanyards. And if you want someone to pray with you, just, just get their eye. They'll do that with you. Okay, let's stand together. Let me pray, and then we'll worship. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. And I thank you that it tells us that you haven't changed, that you're actually the same yesterday, today, forever. And so because you are and we trust you and because we've heard you, we come back to you with all of our hearts for we ask, Father, that you would receive us as you said you would in Jesus' name. Amen.